You're tuned into Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. I'm your host, Dustin Quick. This is episode 10. Tonight, we will be discussing the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. I have a very special guest on, Mr. Daniel Suazo. And uh, before I introduce my guest and let him um, introduce himself further, I just want to do a plug, as I do for every episode, for Havana Palace in Windsor, Ontario, on Huron Church Road. Go see Caesar and Eli. They will hook you up. Finest uh, cigars, best service. Just let them know that you heard about Havana Palace from this podcast. All right, Brother Daniel. So you are a Messianic Jewish believer in Yeshua, Jesus, HaMashiach, the Messiah. All right. So uh, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about, you know, your journey, your upbringing, and uh, we'll get on to our subject from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's going on, everyone? My name is Daniel. I am originally from New York. I've moved around a lot, and now I ended up in Japan. As mentioned by Dustin over here, I am a Messianic Jew, which basically means I'm a Jewish believer in Yeshua or Jesus. Even though I was raised as a Protestant Christian, it wasn't until about a decade ago or so, give or take a couple years, that I started getting closer to the Jewish roots of the faith and ended up going through different Messianic Jewish communities. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Different communities, just trying to find a home. Um, and it was great. I learned a lot of things. Uh, but... As time progressed, it led me to where I am now in the realization that there's a lot that I have missed because of my Protestant bringing that was quite anti-Catholic. Uh, but then later on, as I continued to study, discovered, wait a second, I think these guys may be right. So that's where I am now, Jewish believer in Yeshua, learning a little bit about Catholicism, falling in love with everything I see because it is so Jewish that you would not believe. Amen, brother. And uh, I can definitely second that as the driving force and premise for my podcast was to show how Catholicism is the restoration and fulfillment of the temple religion, the biblical religion of ancient Israel. So I totally feel you on that. And how, how I uh, how I came across uh, Daniel's uh YouTube channel was basically by accident. Well, you could say accident or you could say, you know, divine providence. But essentially, I was just scrolling through my, uh, my YouTube feed and a, and a video popped up and says, um, you know, something to the effect of uh, a messianic Jewish view of the Eucharist. So yeah. here I am thinking, well, I've, I've heard them before. I, I know it's, you know, largely from a Protestant milieu. Yeah. And um, He's probably going to say, oh, it's just a symbol. The Catholic Church and the Orthodox believe this crazy thing where they eat God and it's a, it's a re-sacrifice of Christ and all the rest of it. So somebody had actually shared this video in a, a Facebook group called the Association of Hebrew Catholics, which is a, a real association, but they also have a Facebook page. And so um, I asked the guy who posted the link, I said, does he affirm real presence? And I couldn't even wait for him to answer. I had to jump into the video. I'm like, no, I got to see this. That Because why else would he post it in there, right? There's got to be some kind of catch to it. That's um, right. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to it. I'm watching him. And I'm just floored. Like, I'm floored. You know, the, the honesty, the humility. For someone to say, look, you know, this is this is what I was raised in. This is what I was led to believe. And you really had no vested interest. You didn't have a confirmation bias per se. All you wanted to do was look at the earliest believers in Yeshua, Jesus. What did they believe about this topic? Um, and you went where the evidence led, regardless of where that was. So I really admire that. You didn't have a bias to confirm and you were open and the Lord you know, continue to enlighten you and open your heart more and more. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me about that. Like, yeah, where, where did, where did you, where did you come from 
as far as your view of the Eucharist and how did it start to shift or change as you started to study more and embark on this journey? Yeah, so I think it, it kind of has to tie down, first of all, with the, the history of how I was raised. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, I was raised with a really strong anti-Catholic um, bias, if you will. So it's totally the opposite of the com confirmation bias, where mm -hmm. I'm not trying to confirm this at all. I'm trying to disprove it if I can. But that was me in the past. In this time in my life, I wasn't actually even trying to um, argue against the Catholic Church. It wasn't even in my view. Mm -hmm. Rather, what interested me the most was just getting to understand what the earliest believers believed. So that's actually one of the things that drew me into Messianic Judaism so much. Number one, because it's part of my heritage. And number two, because I wanted to know what it was like back then. Mm -hmm. But the more I studied Jewish sources, the more I started to think maybe it makes sense to also study what the actual ancient believers of Yeshua believed, not just what the non-Yeshua Jewish people believed, if that makes sure. sense. Sure, yep. And as I did that, um, I started to notice that one thing always stood out. And I'm talking about all the way from Scripture, from the book of Yohanan, the book of John, all the way to the Brich Hadasha, which is the New Testament. And then from there, I got an interest in the pre nicene Fathers or the Apostolic Fathers, which are the direct students of the Apostles themselves. So I'm talking about Clement of Rome, Ignatius mm. of Antioch, uh, I, Irenaeus is not 100% direct, but he's just one step away. Right. And everybody mentions the Eucharist. And I just didn't understand why I never thought of it as a big deal. And it's interesting to me that as I looked at this ceremony, if you will, mm. there was the involvement of wine and the bread. And it stood out to me because as a Jewish person, every Shabbat, which is like, it begins at Friday night, Friday sunset until Saturday sunset. We, we also have this presentation of wine and we have the bread as well. Mm -hmm. So it seemed familiar yet different because everything that I saw said that this was partaking in the sacrifice of Jesus, Yeshua's sacrifice, number one. So you are partaking in a sacrifice. Number two, this whole concept of the real presence. Now, right. going back to my Protestant background, I was told that it was just a symbol. And then now I'm seeing that everybody took it literal. So it really shocked me. It was a little bit of a culture shock type of thing. But it wasn't until later on that um, as I started to analyze it more and more through a Jewish lens, it just made perfect sense. Wow. Yeah, so there's, there's two major, I guess, talking points or themes that emerge here. And that is, one, the Eucharist as sacrifice yep. and the Eucharist as real presence. Yeah. Um, and like you said, you had a real interest in the pre-Nicene fathers, right? So yeah. uh, I just have a quote here from Margaret Barker that I wanted to share. Um, and as my, probably my listeners know by now, she's, uh, well, now she's a retired Methodist preacher. She's the inventress or foundress of this discipline of study known as temple theology, whom I've had on my um, podcast once already, and we'll have her again next Sunday. But um, she's quoting here the Anglican theologian, Dom Gregory Dix, and she's, she quotes Dix as saying this, quote, from the earliest days of Clement of Rome in the first century, for whom our Lord is, quote, the high priest of our offerings, end quote, who is, quote, in the heights of the heavens. It can be said with truth that this doctrine of the offering of the earthly Eucharist by the heavenly priest at the heavenly altar is to all intents and purposes the only, emphasis mine, conception of the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is known anywhere in the church. There is no pre-Nicene author, Eastern or Western, whose Eucharistic doctrine is at all fully stated, who does not regard the offering and consecration of the Eucharist as the present action of the Lord himself, the second person of the Trinity. So it's just what you said. You said this was a unanimous uh, belief 
there was no yeah. variation right from the earliest times and yeah. barker citing Dix says the exact same thing whether the father is eastern or western yeah. the concept is the same right everywhere so, everywhere so what about this explain why don't we go through um some of this theology so yeah. um when we say let's do sacrifice first because this is a this is a big one right people yeah. sometimes object and say well how can the eucharist be a sacrifice christ mm -hmm. died once on calvary the sacrifice to end all sacrifices the book of hebrews talks about not sacrificing perpetually for sins the mass is celebrated perpetually it's a sacrifice therefore you're going against the book of hebrews um how is this not doing that how can christ how can the mass of of jesus christ uh, be a sacrifice and yet not contradict that christ died once for all for sinners can you maybe walk us through that yeah absolutely so one of the things to take into account is the priesthood when we're talking about the book of Hebrews, which was most likely written before the destruction of the temple, we know that the Levitical priesthood was the one that stood, and thus they presented their sacrifices daily and yearly for the Yom Kippur sacrifice, the Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. So those sacrifices were presented, in, in a sense, perpetually. It was done every day. This new priesthood that we're under, which is akin to what we see in scripture, they call it that Melchizedek priesthood. Right. This is the eternal one. This is a priesthood that has no bounds in regard to time or space. This is why it's said that it's in the heavenly tabernacle. We also are told in scripture that Yeshua, Jesus, is the lamb that was slaughtered before the creation of the world. Amen. So right off the bat, we get all these hints throughout scripture letting us know that this sacrifice of Yeshua is not bound by time. It's not time, but not bound by location. Mm. It's completely outside of this earthly realm, which when we take that into account, then we already have to discard this whole notion of re-sacrificing him. Because how could he die at Calvary, but have already been slaughtered from the beginning of the world exactly yeah it wouldn't make any sense until you understand the fact that god is immaterial and timeless and thus he is not bound by those rules and i think not just catholics but protestants realize the fact that because god is the creator of this space-time continuum he's outside of it all he can look at it and it's all one moment to him even mm -hmm. though to us it's a linear concept so this whole partaking of it also root, roots itself in the ancient scriptures, the Torah, or the law of Moses. It tells us in the book of Exodus chapter 13 uh, that whenever we're telling our children of the sacrifice of the Passover, we are to tell our children throughout all our generations that God delivered us. Not our mm. people in the past, but he delivered me from my captivity, right? So when you're partaking of that Passover sacrifice, the Pesach sacrifice, you are partaking in that exact moment. Right. It's the same concept with the mass. Even though you may be partaking it for now, you know, around 2,000 years, you're not re-sacrificing Yeshua. You're just partaking in that very same sacrifice, the one that was offered in Calvary, and the same one that was slaughtered before the creation of the world. So there is no contradiction in it once you realize that our God is greater than this physical dimension that we're a part of. Amen, brother. And, and you know, a way to think of it too, uh, connected with what you said, is when the earthly liturgy, so the heavenly liturgy is the eternal now. It's just, it, it always has been, always will be. Christ right is he's offering himself in in eternity from before the foundation of the world as the melchizedek high priest so he already has the marks in his hands and his feet interceding at the at the right hand of the father right from before everything yeah so if that's perpetually taking place in in one eternal moment mm -hmm. then the earthly liturgy is not a redoing of what has already been accomplished in eternity rather it is 
our entering in and our participating in eternity, what is already taking place. Yeah. So, so that the effects of Christ's sacrifice and his grace can be applied to us in our life, in our situation, and change us. It doesn't change him. Yes, exactly. And you know what? Now, as, as you're speaking, it gives me this mental image. Imagine a bubble where this is our physical realm, and this is God's realm. I know that it's, it's kind of weird to point it out in a physical image because he's outside of this physical realm, right? But imagine mm -hmm. this one point. And every time that the mass is offered is another singular point. But for that moment when it is offered is a now moment, right? Right. God is part of the eternal now. So every time that we partake of it is just lines connecting to the same dot, that mm -hmm. same moment. So again, not re not re-sacrificing him, but re-presenting that same sacrifice, partaking in this moment. And it's so huge. It's so huge. I'm coming in from a Jewish background and a Protestant background. And I want this to come out to anybody who's Catholic that's listening that partakes of the Eucharist. I just want to mention, since I'm not Catholic yet, not in communion with the church, I can't partake in the Eucharist. And I am jealous. <laughs> <laughs> with a holy type of jealousy, a holy jealousy, because I, I wish that everyone could understand how huge of a deal it is to be able to say that you are partaking in that sacrifice, that eternal one, mm -hmm. you're partaking of it. And it's so effective and powerful. If you ever imagine, oh, man, if I was right there at the foot of the cross, how, how amazing it would be to be so close to him. But you don't feel that same emotion and that power and that passion when you take the Eucharist. I, I really want you to reconsider how big of a deal it is in what you're participating. Amen, brother. You said it. I mean, it's funny because uh, St. John Chrysostom in the fourth century, um, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to the effect of he was telling his congregation, you often say, oh, I wish I could touch you know, touch the hem of his garment. I wish that I could see him, uh, you know, feel him and so on and so on. He's like, you do. Exactly. He's like, you, you consume him. <laughs> so just think about it. The, the way that the apostles were, their intimacy with him, sitting with him, learning from him, journeying with him, our union is even greater. Yeah. I mean, not to, well, there was a point at which, you know, when he instituted the Last Supper, they would have experienced that same union. But I'm just speaking of their day-to-day -day interaction. That's I right. mean, we do touch him. We do handle him. We do speak yeah. with him. We do see him. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, I have, I have a friend who actually said, man, if, 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 if people understood what they were, the, the magnanimity of what they, were, what they were participating in, he's like, He's like, I think I would crawl over glass, <laughs> you know, yeah. I would, I would crawl down the altar over, uh, over glass to get to him. And there's yeah. actually a story, um, something that always stands out to me. It was this little girl in communist China. Mm. Um, so these communists had d desecrated a church or destroyed a church and they spilled, uh, the blessed sacrament out into the street. So every night, this little Chinese girl under the cover of darkness would sneak and consume the host, every little crumb, you know, every, every host, every fragment. Yeah. And then what, at one time she was caught by a guard and shot in the head. Whoa. But like, this is, this is the faith that we are to have, you know, That's we right. should, not, we should not take this lightly. And, and what does St. Paul say? Um, the reason why some of you are sick and some of you have died is because you, you do not discern the body of the Lord rightly, yes. right? Yes. Exactly. It's, it's such a huge deal. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've come from this background that told me that the Eucharist was a symbol. And as I've been learning about the Catholic Church, I also am aware of the sad news that for a lot of even Catholic people don't really believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. And now that I've been learning all of these things, it, it hurts me to see that someone that actually is able to participate in this very real 
sacrifice of Yeshua. You're literally consuming his body. And it's not, it's not treated with the respect that it should be done. It breaks my heart. But I think with everything that's happening now in the world, mm-hmm. now is the time for people to really double down on their study Read your scriptures and see, because you just brought up a really good scripture right there when Shaul or the Apostle Paul, he's talking about the fact that many people were getting sick or dying because they didn't discern the body. They didn't acknowledge that this really was Yeshua. Right. That this was Jesus. And if it was just common bread, why would anybody get sick or die? So think of that. Right. Think of all the history that shows of the fact that he is really there. And then for people that are coming in from my side of the world, from the Jewish perspective or just Messianic Jewish perspective, analyze the fact that if, for example, you're coming in from a, uh, a Jewish background, for example, you know that when we participate in Pesach, we're always taught by the Torah, the Torah, the law of Moses, the sages, the rabbis, they have always said that when you uh, participate in Pesach, the Passover, you are participating in that very real sacrifice that was done uh, by the ancient Israelites. Right. So if they're able to do so, we're also able to do so, and even more with the body of Yeshua himself, Jesus. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's wonderful, and it's so beautiful to see that we can have such an intimate relationship with him, where we don't just have to use the power of our imagination to be like, Oh, I, I, I can feel your presence. No, you can literally have it within you. Amen. It's huge. Amen. Yeah. You're so amazing. Right. And you know, Messianic Judaism, as we were kind of talking before we went on live or not live, but recording, um, we said how in essence, it, it's, it's basically in, in many aspects, like, a Protestant denomination and its ethos and it's the way it treats, you know, sola scriptura or, you know, uh, sort of rituals. I mean, yeah, you have, depending on what group you're dealing with, you have, you know, various degrees of Hebraism, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things people have to understand is that like Catholicism, we're not trying to incorporate rabbinic judaism or post-temple judaism we're taking it all the way back to the temple in jerusalem uh, and that's what's important so we had things like what can you tell us about the bread of the presence i mean i remember watching your video and you said that they would actually the priest would actually expose the bread for the people to see and he would say something to them as he elevated it right Yes. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, if you look in the, in the Talmud, which is basically, if you're not familiar with the Talmud, the Talmud is a compilation of the oral tradition that has been handed down throughout Jewish history. It has a lot of commentary, uh, historical facts as well, but basically that's what it is, just the oral tradition with laws and instructions. In there, in a section called Berachot, I believe it's 29a, it tells us a story of how, and, and I mentioned story, but I mean like the literal fact. Yeah, that the fact, yeah. On the Feast of First Fruits, every year, the priests would come out with the table of the bread of the presence before the people. But keep in mind how big of a deal it is uh-huh. because the common folk never got to experience what it was like to be inside of the temple in the Holy of Holies or in just the holies. Right. So there's two levels, right? You have the holies and the Holy of Holies, but the common folk never got to see any of that in the holies. It was only the priest. And in the Holy of Holies, it was only the high priest. Mm -hmm. But once a year, the priest would bring out the table of the bread of the presence and show it to the people. They would lift it up. And they would say, behold, God's love for you. And it's amazing. Just thinking about the fact that this bread is called the bread of the presence. And isn't that exactly what the Eucharist is? The bread, which once blessed, is the very presence of God. It is him revealed right there to us. And we are able to partake in that. And that is God's love for us because it's called the Eucharist. In Greek, Eucharistia, which means Thanksgiving, right? So what are we 
giving thanks to God for, for his love, his mercy, his compassion that was so great that it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him may have eternal life and that right. we would not perish. So that is exactly what it was back then. It's God lo God's love for us. So if you ever see that, if you see the priest raising that host, yep. consecrated, behold, it is God's love for you. For you. you. Isn't, that, isn't that funny? I mean, <laughs> the, the priest would come out and, and elevate the bread of the presence and say, behold, God's love for you. And if you've ever seen um, videos or in person of a priest doing Eucharistic benediction uh, mm -hmm. after Eucharistic adoration, mm -hmm. what does he do? He holds up, he holds up the Eucharist, yeah. right? So you get that exact same image. It's wild. I mean, wild. that's wild, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, you know what? And that's one of the things that as I started to look at all of these things, okay, remember again, I'm coming at it from an anti-Catholic background, but also a Jewish background. Right. And as I start learning about the early believers, and then I naturally gravitated towards the Catholic church. And I started looking into the Orthodox church, but for reasons that I maybe will speak at another time, uh, I, my eyes have been drawn to the Catholic church. I noticed that the Catholic Church is simply the continuation of Temple Judaism. And I, and I really like yeah. that you pointed that fact out, and that's the, the focus of your podcast and your YouTube channel. Because Temple Judaism, we have to recognize as believers in God that it is God-given. Yeah. Rabbinic Judaism is, unfortunately, if, for my Jewish brothers, and it... it might offend some people, but it's the truth. It is not God-given. This is man-made. But the beauty of it is that God has still put hints in yep. there so that people like me that are learning through the Jewish lens, we can see it and say, wow, actually, all of these things that I'm seeing in the Catholic world, our rabbis have said similar things to that. Our history proves that those things are actually true. So when I'm looking at the Talmud, out of all places, I'm seeing something that yeah. makes me understand the Eucharist better. And that, you know, like, like I said, I was raised in a bias, but now it makes me feel more comfortable looking at it through this view. Um, so it's really, really good to understand that uh, this all has been set before us in prefigurations. Mm -hmm. And when we look at those things, we can an understand the reality of all of it. Because it's so big, you know? Right, so, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wow, yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, I had made a, I've made a pretty bold claim um, mm. when, I, when I say, and I've said this before, but it's worth repeating. Um, Christianity, and in particular, Catholicism, does not make sense without the temple. I mean... Yeah. It, it is what it is, right? But with it, it makes complete sense. That's why the earliest believers, even though, okay, let's say, here's the, here's the, here's the irony though, and God has a sense of humor. You know, it's like people say, oh, uh, you know, the, the, the Gentile church, the Catholic church lost its Jewish roots. Mm -hmm. at, you know, they all give different dates, right? But whatever yeah. the date is, right? They all, say, they all say at some point they broke with their Jewish roots. But here's the thing. Yeah. Catholicism is so Jewish by its very nature, it's ver yeah. the very fabric of its essence, that yeah. even though the majority of people are Gentile believers, mm -hmm. the very religion, the very rituals, the very devotions that they celebrate are so Jewish that you can't disentangle it and say... That's the, that's the, and this is Paul's prophecy, right? I mean, yeah. I'm getting animated right now. Cause I just like, I'm so <laughs> excited. I can't help it, man. It I, I love, I love this stuff. And I mean, what, what does Paul say? Right. He said the reasons why, the reason why um, the olive branch was broke off was because of pride and rejection of the Messiah. And so as a, as, as a result, he grasped the Gentiles in and then he warns the Gentiles don't become yeah. too proud. Lest you become broken off like they were. Yeah, and absolutely. you know, you mentioned in your uh, video, 
you know, that uh, we're starting to see more and more uh, Jews recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And right. in, in the Catholic catechism, uh, it's Catholic teaching, actually, that um, one of the heralding signs of the return of Christ is the corporate recognition by Jews as Jesus as the Messiah. Yes. So that's Absolutely. very interesting that you pointed that out. And, and let me speak on that, if you don't mind, Dustin. Sure, sure. Number one, I just want to put one random little fact. So you mentioned about the, the church being looked at as a, the Gentile church. I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but this is something that we get from the Torah, the Torah, the law, and also from the sages. When the people of Israel were able to get out of Egypt when God mm -hmm. delivered them, it tells us that it was a mixed multitude, right? So it wasn't yeah. just the Israelites by birth, but it was also a bunch of Egyptians and a lot of people from other tribes and nations coming along with them. So it was always mixed. The kingdom of God has always been mixed. The sages, however, tell us that the majority of the people that came out of Egypt mm. were not even Israelite. They were actually the minority. Oh. And it was... It was actually, if you, if you would, the Gentiles were the bigger group that came along with them, which I is did not a random that. little fact. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. And this is by the sages that tell us this. Um, but just to go back to, to what you're talking about, that uh, even in the catechism, it tells us that when the large influx of the Jewish people start coming in, that's when you know you're getting towards the end. So a couple of things to mention that are really, really important. Mm -hmm. One is there seems to be a decline, right? In, in all churches, this is not just the Catholic church, but I'm talking even Protestant groups going down. Right. But yeah. then you're seeing this movement of Messianic Judaism and Hebrew roots, which is basically people that are in love with the ancient, if you will. Sure. They want to sure. go back to the traditions. They want to go back to the old ways. And it's cool because you get to learn a lot. You get to look, dig into the history, into the scriptures. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, some people don't get to see the beauty of where it really, really can take you, which is what I'm, I'm not trying to like boast and say I'm the enlightened one. But what I'm trying to say is because of me digging into that history, it led me to the understanding that the people that have been holding to the ancient path is mm. the Catholic Church. Like you mentioned, it is so thoroughly Jewish. You have a priesthood. You had the sacrifice. I look at the priest in their vestments, and I think of the high priest in his holy vestment. I look at the cathedrals and the churches, and I think of the temple. I see the liturgy, the way that things are sung in, in the church. This is exactly what was done in the temple, the yeah. liturgy. It's all so Jewish. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, listening to this other podcast where this Catholic gentleman points to the fact that the Gregorian chant mm -hmm. actually comes from the Jewish tradition of the temple chants and songs that were done, which it just blows my mind to see how thoroughly Jewish it is. So with all of that being said, even though I see that Numbers might be going down, but a lot of people are getting this love for the ancient. I think truly that God is using this movement of the love of the old to bring people to the Catholic church. And these people are the ones that are going to reawaken the church and say, you yeah. know what? Yeah. You have a treasure. Don't ignore it. Appreciate it and take advantage of what you have Amen. because you have the ancient path. Amen. And I think that that's why I feel so blessed now that I'm able to see this now. It's so beautiful that when I look at the Catholic church now, I'm like, man, these guys really have it. So it's like the treasure hidden in a field, right? There are so many Catholics who just, they grow up culturally or nominally Catholic or whatever. And, and that's not unique to Catholicism. Every culture and religion has that sort of uh, phenomenon. Yeah. But I mean, just imagine like sitting on this treasure your entire life and, and not realizing like, yeah. you know, and, and, and we always say the greatest, the greatest, the greatest gift to the church are converts. But I, I would say even specifically because of what you've said, 
I would say that there is a, there's a very unique set of converts that can bring a whole wealth of gifts, and that would be the Jewish people, you know, for the precise reasons that you said. Because you know what? There's the, the Hebrew Roots Movement, <clears throat> the Messianic Jewish Movement, like you said, they have this thirst and love for the ancient, mm -hmm. but it's like they're almost looking, I don't want to say they're looking in the wrong place, but they're like looking to recreate something that never kind of existed in the first place. Yes. They're yep. like trying to cut it from whole cloth and reinvent the wheel, yep. whereas yep. it's been here the entire time. Yes. You know, and... Yep. Yeah, and Justin, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off in that one because there's something so important about that that I mentioned in one of my videos. And it's the fact that there is also a danger with these movements that I've noticed personally. Now, I, I thank my Heavenly Father first and then my Earthly Father second because of the fact that I was always raised with the desire to always verify everything. Don't believe just because you hear it. Mm -hmm. Search it. Because of that, I feel that God has sheltered me from a lot of the error that I see that a lot of people in these movements are falling into. And that is this, like you mentioned, it's like they're trying to reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say this in any type of disrespectful way, but rather out of love and as a warning, because this is what usually happens. People become enchanted by the old and they think that rabbinic Judaism is the ancient path when rabbinic Judaism actually ended up developing after Christianity began to flourish. That's right. So in reality, that's not the true ancient path and it's actually a deviated path. This is what happened in history. Mm -hmm. You had the, the religion of the Hebrews was this temple Judaism. The temple is destroyed in 70 AD and it was the time to decide where this was going to go. Yeah. If you are a believer in Jesus, in Yeshua, you should know that, you know, around 30 AD was the time of the sacrifice that he gave, that he became. From that time, if you did not know this, even in the Talmud, it tells us in tractate Yoma 39b, it tells us that at 40 years before the destruction of the temple, which is again around 30 AD, mm -hmm. at that time, the sacrifices were no longer accepted by God. So every Yom Kippur, the priest would tie a red cord on the horns of the lambs, of yep. the goats, and they would send it off. And that cord, if God accepted the sacrifice, it would turn white. This is what the sages tell us. On the, um, on the temple, the doors remained closed always. But after that 30 AD period, the doors would open by themselves. The cloth would never turn white. The lot, there was also lots that were cast by the priest. Mm -hmm. And whatever, if it said for God, and you got that lot on your right hand, that also verified that God accepted the sacrifice. After 30 AD, the Talmud tells us that the sacrifices were no longer accepted. Who came in at 30 AD with a sacrifice? Mm. Yeshua, Jesus. What happens 40 years after his sacrifice, the temple is destroyed. Take it back to the time of the, of the Hebrews, the Israelites in the desert. They were 40 years stranded in the desert, complaining instead mm -hmm. of accepting that God was their salvation. And salvation, by the way, means Yeshua. That's right. Which is Jesus. Yeah. So they were left in the wilderness for 40 years. And what happens after Yeshua comes? Jesus, the the Israelites are again left in a spiritual wilderness oh, for yeah. 40 years where they have the opportunity to accept God's salvation, to accept his Yeshua or complain. And what did we do? We complained. Oh, so our temple gets destroyed. I never, I never realized the, uh, the, the parallelism with the dates there. Thank you for that. that yeah. That's uh, big. And another thing that the, I think it's in the Talmud, uh, they say in the messianic age, all sacrifices will cease except for the Toda or the Thanksgiving sacrifice, right? And that's yeah. Eucharist, Thanksgiving. That's it. Exactly. Exactly. So it was all continuing. And that's the point that I was trying to make. The fact that after 70 AD, after the spiritual wilderness, we had to choose. You're either with the Messiah 
or you're going to have to invent your own religion. And that's what happened. The rabbis ended up gathering at Yavna. A lot of people call it the Council of Yavna, but it's not really mm -hmm. a council. Or Yamnia? I forgot how it's said. Yeah, we, we pronounce it Jamnia. Jamnia. Yeah. So, so in that council, if you will, which wasn't really a council, it was just a gathering of the, those Pharisaic rabbis. They knew that they had to come up with a way, a solution for the lack of temple. Mm -hmm. So then they ended up saying, you know, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting are going to be our new sacrifices. Right. But that's not, that's not from God. That's just men deciding on their own. But this is what I'm trying to say. Since it's split, which one is the true path? Because they cannot be truth. Both, both of yeah. them at the same time. Only one can be. One of them has no sacrifice. One really does. And it's called the Eucharist. One actually has evidence and proof of it historically, and the other one doesn't. And what I mean by that is that rabbinic Judaism has taught that if we keep the laws of the old covenant, that the temple would be rebuilt. But it's been 2,000 years, and it mm -hmm. hasn't been rebuilt. Why? Shaul, Paul tells us, because our bodies have become the temple in which the spirit lives. Right. Amen. So it's, it's for the people that have been wandering off through the messianic movement and you're looking for the ancient, I just want to point out, if you're really in love with the ancient and you want the real ancient path, Catholicism has proven to be the one. Amen, brother. I, I know I'm biased, so I'm going to agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> but, uh, but listen, like, you know, I, not to uh, talk too much about my own journey, but um, I was baptized Catholic as an infant. I mm -hmm. grew up Protestant. I converted to Islam uh, oh. in university. Mm. And then I actually found Christ. I had my first life-changing um, experience and encounter with Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. while I was Muslim and I found a way to sort of combine both religions. Mm -hmm. Then I eventually got to a point where I said, well, I can't really reconcile certain things anymore. So I went back to my childhood faith of Protestantism. Mm -hmm. Then I started looking into the early church because I was convinced I was going to find some form of Calvinism or reformed theology. Um, right. And I didn't, but I'll tell you, I, I remember just crying out to God saying like, I'll do anything, but don't make me become Catholic because I, <laughs> I hated, and I mean, hated the, well, what I should say, hated what I thought the church was like behind every conspiracy you could imagine. I yeah. thought that the Catholic church was like the mother of all boogeymen, you know, all that. <laughs> so, uh, but here I am, you know, here I am. It's yeah. been, uh, going on six years or so. And, Amazing. um, but, uh, I, I just wanted to talk about a few more things. If uh, and yeah. if we're running short on time or you have to go or you just want to wrap it up, just let me know. I don't want to take too much of your time. Yeah, if uh, maybe just a couple more minutes because I'm actually after this, I'm heading to, uh, to synagogue, believe it or not. Uh, because today, for those of us that are watching right now, today is Rosh Hashanah, which is considered the Jewish New Year. Uh, so Shana Tova to all of you. <laughs> well, happy feast. Uh, Thank you. Um, so yeah, let's let's just maybe if we could start to talk about one more, um, let's say one more uh, sort of mini subject, and then we can wrap it up. And I, you know, uh, Daniel, I, if you would bless and honor me, uh, I would love to have you on again. Yes, um, I'd like to talk more about maybe, you know, the the uh, authority structure in the Catholic Church. Talk about the Jewish roots of that. Um, yeah. So that's actually oh, a, a huge one. But yeah, so if, if we could do that maybe uh, in a future episode. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I, I just quickly wanted to, to brush over John 6. Mm, okay, yes. the bread of life discourse. Absolutely. Now, you know, we all know that Catholics say Jesus was clearly talking about himself as the bread from heaven. And yeah. he was saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And the people got scandalized. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And they were so disgusted that they walked away. And he didn't say, hold on, guys. It's, uh, I didn't really mean it. But he doubled down and said it again, right? Uh, so we all know the apologetic, right? right? But 
there is an objection that I that I get every so often, or I run across in certain biblical commentaries. Yeah, and they they try to say, well, the Catholics and the Orthodox, by extension, um, misapplicate and misunderstand this passage because Jesus is clearly he's not he's not saying what the Catholics think he's saying. Rather, he's he's saying he's us, using eat and drink as metaphors for having faith and believing in as in eating Jesus's words, drinking his wisdom. And yeah. it's not talking about any sacramental kind of reality. How mm. would you respond to that? If you could just maybe get started on that. Yeah. So number one with that, if he was symbolic, he would have clarified it like he did with pretty much every other parable that he's told. In right. The past. But he didn't. Second, the people were offended because they realized what it actually meant literal that's why they walked away and that's why he yeshua even asks his own disciples are you going to leave me now and they don't so that's just part of it the other part is this traditionally from the people that tend to say that it's symbolic um mm -hmm. i'll give you an example i after i put my video out about my views on the eucharist and i mentioned how i believe it to be literal somebody commented and said what he meant is that it represents his body and I said, that's your interpretation. But he said, this is my body and this is my, my blood. So if he is saying it and we are saying something else, then by definition, we're just inventing a new understanding and we're going against it. But those are just smaller points. The other huge mm -hmm. point is this. There's so many things to this, actually. The other point is this. Take into account what Paul says later on. People were getting sick and dying right. for consuming the blessed bread and wine. And if it's just a symbol and it's just regular bread, why are people getting sick and dying? Are they overeating with the bread? Are they eating pounds and tons of bread? And maybe that's why they died. Not likely, right? Yeah, yeah. So we have to understand that that was kind of chicken uh, tongue in cheek. But what I'm trying to drive at is that it had to be real for it to be so. We also have the historical evidence that proves that every single believer believed it to be real. Yes. But just sticking only to Yohanan 6, to John 6, we are able to see that he was being straight up and very literal because he doesn't mention it once or twice. He mentions it several times. Uh -huh. Yeshua says it. You have to consume it. You have to consume it. And another thing that I want to point out is this. Look at it from the Hebrew lens. Why were the people scandalized in the first place? Yeah. You know, there's, there's cultures out there that are cannibalistic and it's nothing wrong with it. But why was it a big deal to them? Mm -hmm. It was a big deal because in the Torah, in the law, we're told that we're not to, we're not to consume the blood of animals. Mm -hmm. This is one of the laws and you find it in the book of Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. And it tells us, do not drink the blood of the animals. But why? Because the life is in the blood. Right. So the people were scandalized because they have that in mind. Because they know that if they are consuming someone's blood, they're consuming that life. But what, what is Yeshua? What is Jesus talking about throughout all of these things? He's talking about the fact that if you consume his blood and his flesh, you're obtaining eternal life. And if it's a symbol, you're not going to get eternal life from a symbol. But right. if you're actually really consuming him, then it makes sense. Then Leviticus 17.11 makes sense. Then the fact that people are getting sick and dying would make sense. Then the fact that everybody throughout history saw it literal would make sense. But yes. you know what doesn't make sense? To say that it's just a symbol when he never said it was. Yeah, and you make a good point about life being in the blood, um, just quickly, because, um, you know, the whole thing was God didn't want the Israelites to become animals, right? No. It, it, he didn't want them to become base and follow their carnal desires and live off instinct. So if, yeah. you, if you're consuming the, the blood of an animal, the, I, the idea is that you become with that which you consume, yeah. right? But Christ wants us to become one with him, so in consuming him, we become what he is, by nature, by grace, exactly. you know, de deification, in other words, which is eternal life. 
Yes. Um, so, yeah. So um, I don't want to take too much of your time, but let me just say this, Daniel. Um, I, I will keep you in my daily rosary intentions to our good Jewish mother that you will come into full communion and you will bring yes. your multitude of gifts and your gracious presence and everything else into the church because Holy Mother Church would be blessed and joy-filled to have you. And um, I cannot wait. And I hope that I'm one of the first people you tell. Um, and I promise that I will get a nice fancy cigar to celebrate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to have you back on. We'll discuss uh, this sort of Jewish precedent for Catholic authority um, and, see, and see those connections. So uh, with that, I'll just close the show. Oh, uh, and they can find you on YouTube at Messianic Me TV, correct? That's correct. So yeah, my channel is Messianic Me TV. Uh, definitely check out the videos. Specifically, the uh, I have a playlist called New Covenant. This is when you can actually trace when my mentality started to publicly change. Even though I had been studying about these things for about a year or so, a little bit more, it, it wasn't until that time that I started putting videos to hint that I was learning all these things that made sense with Catholicism. Um, but yes, check it out, Messianic Me TV. I also, Dustin, I just wanted to thank you for having me on on your show. Uh, this has been fantastic, and I'm so happy to be able to have someone like you that actually with all interaction with Catholics that I've had thus far has been super welcoming, and that's very inspirational. Uh, so I appreciate your prayers, your welcoming, and everybody listening, please pray for me because I hope to soon be in communion with the church. It's something that I'm in the process of doing right now. I was, I was actually going to go today, um, mm. but because I'm going to the feast, I'm not going to be able to go today. So maybe next Saturday, I'll be able to do that. Wonderful. Start seeing how, how Wonderful. I can make that happen. Well, it, so, listen, yes. anything you need, um, my door is always open. Just shoot me an email. Um, any questions, um, any way I can help, I'll be glad to do so. Um, so this has been Holy Smokes, Cigars, Catholicism, and Conversation. Let my prayer arise in thy sight as incense. This has been episode 10 with my guest, Daniel Suazo, talking about the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. And before I go, just want to close in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. God Man, bless I you. Cross myself too. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, brother. I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> You're on your way. All right. We'll uh, we'll see you again uh, soon. Okay. All right, brother. God bless. God bless, God bless. everyone. Okay. All right.